Thanks so much. It's great to be here with all of you. And uh, it's great to join. I know Dominic and uh, Michael aren't here, but I just want to say how excited I, I am to be one of the other Cherish people. Um, I know they're big brains, and I'm really look for, looking forward to working with them and Chris. And you can see how enthusiastic and passionate Chris is. And I'm very, very excited. Um, he, ha he had me at hello, as they say, when we talked on the phone and, and emailed back and forth about his vision for the School of Public Policy. And, and I can tell you there are other places to go for people like me, and I was really excited uh, to join Chris at this school. So I want to thank, of course, uh, Antonia and Suzanne and Tom. And in particular, I really want to say a big thank you to the Max Bell Foundation board that are here, that have made the trip here. If you're not from here, thank you. Thank you for making the contribution, but also thank you for taking a bit of a risk because this is a new type of school. And I know that you know that well because you've spent a lot of time with Chris listening to what his vision is, uh, and I think it's worth it. I think it might be a little, there might be, you know, he talked, we talked about risk and reward, and I think you're going to see reward for your investment. So thank you very much. Chris mentioned a bit about my public life. Most recently, I was leader of the opposition um, in the House of Commons. And I have to tell you, you know, I'll just mention a lot of people always ask me, what is it like to be you know, the leader, a leader in the House of Commons? Because it is unusual. You, I was an MP for many years. It's different being the leader. So, you know, the whole brand is on your shoulders and you, know, you have to sort of carry the team. It's a lot of pressure. But, you know, it's one thing to be the leader in that, uh, pers you know, from that perspective. But I always say to people, there's that, and then there's actually being the leader in the House of Commons, physically. Because just imagine that you're, whoever you are, trying to make your point, you know, to, a, you know, your boss or your CEO or to whoever, your supervisor, your academic supervisor, you're trying to get your point across. So you stand up. And, you know, you're in a room the size of a gymnasium, and there's 307 people sitting around you. And above you, there's hundreds of more people. And there is a TV camera pointed right at you with live national TV coverage. And when you get up to make your point, literally, everything happens to you short of someone throwing a shoe at you. And you're supposed to be, you know, gathered, and focused, and of course, when you're a woman, you have to be graceful on top of all of it. So it's quite an experience. Well, I always say when I speak publicly now to please feel free to heckle me. I feel much more comfortable if you heckle me while I'm speaking. <laughs> um, so of course, the question always follows, you know, why would you leave? You know, why would you leave such a place? Um, no, it's been, it was really an incredible privilege to be uh, where I was for 13 years, whether it was sitting in cabinet, around the table, as a member of parliament, representing the people that elected me, uh, or as the leader of a national political party. But, which brings me to why I'm here today. Because after 13 years of public life, I have to say that I didn't start off that way, but I became quite good at politics. But what I was always passionate about, and even before um, I went into politics, was public policy. So I feel like I'm going a bit full circle. But in that 13 years, I really had what I would say is a front row seat, both, as I said, in government, but also as an active member of a political party, developing and implementing and communicating public policy throughout those years. And I think I've learned a bit about um, what is lacking, what kind of support is needed, what works best, what maybe doesn't work so well, what resonates with the public, what alienates the public even further, because that's something we really need to think about right now, and why the policy to process, uh, the development process itself is so crucial in achieving a desired outcome. Also, who needs to be included? Who actually has to be included in the process and why? And as we say in politics, and Chris mentioned this, everything is decided by communications. You learn that very quickly when you're part of the government or part of any political party. You can design the best laid policy plan and it goes nowhere because you communicated it badly. So I really look forward to being able to contribute my small bit of experience in that I've gathered in developing, implementing, communicating public policy 
I've seen failures, I've seen successes, but I think that will help us build a policy school that has a bit of a different kind of vision, and in particular, as Chris mentioned, has a more outward-facing public engagement goal, and that is different. And why do we need a school like this? Because frankly, there's a huge disconnect between the public and our institutions. And our policy process operates right now, really, I would suggest to you, in silos. It really does. We have the business community, academia, government, civil society, and to a certain extent, each of them has a bit of a distrust for one another. And then you layer on top of the public, the public has a distrust for all of those things right now, a great deal of the public. And then on top of that, you throw in globalization, the fast pace of technology, the democratization of information through social media, the increased polarization and political debate, and it's clear that we really need to change the, the way we engage as a policy school, or frankly, we will be irrelevant. It won't matter. We can write articles, <laughs> we can deliver speeches, and the people that need to hear them are not going to hear them. Or they're not, at least not, they're not going to hear them in a way that makes a difference in that policy development. And if you aren't engaging the public in some way, because at the end of the day, it's those politicians, it's those people that are working on this that are going to ultimately have to see this work through. They're not going to listen if you're not engaging the public. And how we will engage also is determined uh, will determine whether or not we can reestablish trust in the public. And that's something right now that I think should be front and center for any new institution. It can't be business as usual, I would suggest to you. How we engage with government also matters. We have to take into account, you don't just knock on the door, walk in, help develop a policy, walk out. We can't do that anymore. We have to take into account the practical operations of government, the machinery of government, how the conversations happen around the cabinet table, how the bureaucracy interacts with the political players, where the pressure points are in different, uh, in different political um, environments, and frankly, and one that a lot of people never think of, why and how things actually become blocked from ever seeing the light of day. And many times this is a political issue. We have to recognize these factors. They must be taken into consideration when developing policy. And once again, if not, we'll never get through to the people who actually need to listen. The role of partisan politics. Partisan politics is something that a lot of people don't want to discuss at policy schools, but it is central to policy development because governments don't get reelected, political parties get reelected. So you must be engaging political parties. And in fact, engaging opposition parties who are outside of government is key because it's usually actually after a defeat that political parties begin to renew, to re-engage, and to rebuild. And a big part of that is policy making. And that is actually when po political parties are most able to be flexible and open to new ideas. We also want, and Chris talked about this, the school wants to teach and communicate differently. Communicating and teaching elected officials and business leaders about policy is key. And, you know, I hate to say this, but it has to be done in a way that they can understand. We always joked in government that you have to communicate at a grade four level so that everyone understands, you know, within our group. Um, I don't know what that says about politicians, but it has to be understandable. It has to be translatable to their world. Otherwise, they won't engage. And last but not least, we have to change the way that we engage with the public when we talk about public policy. That means listening. It means respecting different viewpoints and engaging with people in a way, not just in a way that they understand, but where they are. 85% of Canadians now get their news on Facebook. So there's a thought. I mean, that's not a place we usually go, but we have to think about engaging people in a social media platform. Millennials now don't trust institutions. Millennials trust their friends, their family, and people they admire. So how do we get through to them? You know, whether it's videos, Chris is talking about engaging differently, communicating differently. So that's why I'm excited about what I think is going to be a different vision and what Chris is attempting to do here, which is pushing the envelope a bit and engaging and communicating in new ways. And we're starting from scratch, and that's a huge opportunity with the understanding that truly the entire social, 
cultural and political landscape has changed, and so we have to change the way we engage on public policy. And social media has completely changed the way governments and political parties operate to change the perception of how and how fast leaders and policy thinkers actually should respond to the public. I mean, imagine that you are a regular person and you tweet at the most powerful man in the world, the President of the United States, and he actually tweets back at you. And you get a response. This, is, this dynamic has completely changed the way the public interact with their elected officials. And that is incredibly powerful. And you have to recognize that it's had an impact on policy development. And what are the policy challenges? They are, sometimes they feel overwhelming. But we have to tackle them. They're vast. Around the world, people are rejecting globalization. And with it, they're rejecting trade. Who would have ever thought that we had to make the case for the benefits of free trade? Who would have ever thought? Well, we're doing that now. You know, Brian is here, Brian Topp, and we sit on the NAFTA Advisory Council. A lot of people are thinking very hard about how do we make the case for the benefits of free trade, the benefits of NAFTA. Who would have thought we'd be in that situation? And at the same time, as we're struggling to explain the benefits of free trade, we find ourselves with a complete realignment of the political spectrum. The other day, there was a tweet sent out with a photo of Wilbur Ross, who is the Commerce Secretary, I'm sure you know who he is, uh, who is one of the people helping out with NAFTA, and Jerry Diaz, the head of Unifor. I would say they're probably not, you know, first glance going to be fallen the same part of the political spectrum. <laughs> That's an understatement. But there they were, shaking hands in a photo, and they tweeted out, great to work together for the betterment of jobs. It was a complete realignment, and we have to think about that when we think about policy development. You know, energy and environment. Chris has a huge amount of policy depth and experience in this area. But I would suggest as somebody who's watched this for a while, this grand bargain of carbon regulations, carbon taxes in exchange for energy infrastructure has not necessarily worked. What went wrong? What do we need to do differently? We now see provinces trying to block commodities, the free flow of commodities across provincial borders. How are we going to address this issue of climate change in a country that has such vast natural resources? And how are we going to address the issue of rising Western alienation? Because I can tell you, it's a reality. And what will be the future of work? I think this is one that is extremely important for us to think about. What will be the policy response to the hundreds of thousands of jobs that will disappear due to automation? How will we deal with the disruption caused by automation? Will we institute a universal income? And what will that do to the human condition? I would argue that it it potentially could create unrest, but this isn't the issue of a guaranteed annual income is something that we should be talking about with government. I can tell you they're thinking about it around the fringes, but this is an issue that is going to come at us very quickly. And we need to think about retraining and skills. Policy schools should be doing this kind of work now and having these kind of dialogues with elected officials, with union leaders with business leaders, with political leaders, with civil society, and with the public, most importantly. Finally, I would just end by saying, how are we going to make, because this is an institution, our public institutions more robust and credible? When we look around the world, we see what people would suggest is the failure of small L liberal democratic institutions to a certain extent. And it's creating certain you know, certain decisions around, you know, whether it was the collapse of the big banks and the, the mortgage crisis in the United States and the bailout, the decision to bail out big banks, you know, what that did, the impact that had as a policy on the public in the United States, for instance. Some of the policies that the EU, which some people would, in the United States, at least, at least pro-Brexit people would suggest, were an overreach. Um, you know, maybe those things could have been avoided. So at the end of the day, how can we become a trusted voice in an era where people are, the public continues to mistrust institutions? How can we be a trusted source of information? 
So I'll just end by saying I'm actually very optimistic. <laughs> I think we've got the right group of people to tackle some of these really tough issues. I think that there is an opportunity if we tackle this in a way that is inclusive and respectful and brings together the right diversity of voices that we can actually do some good here. And I really look forward to doing things a little bit differently here at the Mac School of Public Policy, and I know we have a lot of work to do, Chris. Um, and on a personal note, I have to say as a Westerner, I'm really glad to see this connection of communities between East and West and Calgary and Montreal. I think that's an important thing for our federation. So I know at the risk of doing things a little bit differently, um, I think we will see some reward. So thank you, Chris, for including me. Thank you to the Max Bell Foundation, and I look forward to doing some great work with all of you. Thanks so much. And should I invite Chris to come up and join me? Chris, I have questions for Chris. I was going to cede my time to just questions from the audience. I'm happy to do that, or we can talk. Sure. Um, do you want, so we don't have much time before you disappear. Okay. Do you carry a watch? I do. Does it work? It's hard not to have an assistant anymore. <laughs> <laughs> or an entourage, as we used to joke about it. So um, how about if we just go for questions to the audience? Sure, okay. yeah, let's do that. Questions from the audience, especially for Rana, because she can give you better answers. Robert Greenhill. Well, I think there's been a lot of effort put into this, the issue of climate change and um, energy infrastructure, and I, I'm being very simplistic when I say this grand bargain of, of uh, carbon taxes or carbon regulations in exchange for energy infrastructure. Um, and, you know, for many different reasons, we have, a, you know, a population now in Alberta who is feeling like... Uh, perhaps their goals aren't part of the Federation's overall goals. Um, and I think that's really dangerous. Um, it's dangerous when we saw the reaction of the former mayor of Montreal around the cancellation of a project that frankly really um, represented hope for a lot of people in Alberta. That's very simplistic as well, but it's the reality of how people were feeling on the ground. And we have a, a province on the other side of Alberta now in British Columbia who is actively against another uh, energy infrastructure project. So it just, I think what I would say to you is that over the course of a little, a short time frame, this has become a very political issue on the ground. And there's a sense that um, there's an environment in which you can see it'd be very easy to stir up um, the feeling of alienation, because it's, it's right there on the surface. Uh, and I don't think that's good for the Federation. I think we need to, you know, as provincial leaders, as federal leaders, as policy leaders, need to be aware of the importance of the relationship between our provinces, but, you know, as federalists in particular, um, we have to think about the things we say and how we say them. Uh, and so I would just say it's very real. Can I just add one thing to this? Not so much on the alienation issue, but the issue of resource development and environmental protection is one, and I'm, I'm uh, Brian, what well, used to be sitting right there. So, there he is. Um, so this is a plug for what Brian might choose to talk about in one, in one of the panels this afternoon. But I think there is a, a big disconnect in the minds of many members of the public uh, about how can it possibly be consistent for a country 
to put a price on carbon emissions and at the same time be a producer of fossil fuels? Like, how do those things possibly add up? I think actually there is a deep logic to that, but I don't think that logic has been explained very well. And that feeds into this sort of issue. And that, that's really about policy communication Absolutely. Absolutely. in a number of different ways, um, implementation. Uh, so, you know, it just speaks to um, making sure that all of those things are aligned. While we're waiting for the next question, Rana and I had agreed to ask each other a couple of questions, a little quiz, three questions each. So we're just waiting for another show of hands. But while we're waiting for somebody to put up their hand, I'm going to ask Rana for her favorite example of a successful policy in Canada, or the world for that matter, and why, why you think it's successful. Well, we talked about, uh, I mentioned two things, was the child benefit and the working in income tax benefit. And, and together, those were things that started under the previous government but were enhanced and targeted under the current government. Um, and they have done remarkable things to lift families out of poverty, um, help with the child care challenge for working women. And I think those are very good examples of successfully developed implemented and communicated and accepted because of that. Widely accepted, widely used. I mean, that's the other question. You can do all those, other, all those things and when there's no uptake of a program is when you ask yourself, what's gone wrong in this program where the evaluation is really important? Why aren't people using it? Um, so in this case, widely used, widely accepted, widely, um, you know, widely, I think, it was, it was needed, um, and I, I, I don't think any future government could ever reverse it. That's another example. That's another, um, I think, measure of a good, pol good public policy Hard also. To Hard to reverse. Yeah. <laughs> I'm still waiting for other hands, but you want to give us an example of a policy failure? Your oh. favorite policy failure? Like one that How I'm responsible for? One that, well, if you'd like to tell us one of yours, that's fine. Yeah, do, you have, no. do you have any? I'm sure I probably do. Um, there's so many. Look, it's, it's, it's a politician's nightmare. Uh, but I think, for, I'll use one from our government so that, you know, I think that's fair. Um, changes to the EI system. We made a policy change to the employment insurance um, system. Very controversial, very difficult to make. Was the right thing to do economically, right thing to do for the Federation, right thing to do for the working people right thing to do for low labor mobility for all kinds of policy reasons and tried to communicate it well but just did not we we did not absorb the cultural context the social context the historical context but more than anything the political context and it was a disaster for us and we lost probably every well we lost every state in Atlantic Canada but I remember that conversation when we had it and we made the decision to do it and we knew that it was the right reason and everybody looked at each other and said, there goes all our seats in Atlantic Canada. We knew it, we could feel it. And yet we still did it because we thought the right thing, you know, always prevails. Well, guess what? Politically, it doesn't always. So in yes, Prime Minister, that would have been political right. courage? That was, yes, that was, yeah. Okay. Policy hero, do you have a policy hero? Well, don't tell him, I told you this, Tom Jenkins, who's a good friend. But he's, you know, he I'm, is a business person, so you probably like you talk about Michael Sabia, uh, chair of Open Text, but has given so much to the policy world, no matter what stripe the government is, provincial, federal, always wanting to help, always wanting to find solutions, um, and just no one tell him I said that, that he's my policy, because <laughs> he's a good friend. But really, I think it's, I really want to thank everyone in this room because you all contribute in different ways, but there's a lot of very successful business people in this country, and I can tell you that only a handful of them do the kinds of things that people like Tom Jenkins, Michael Sabia, and others that I know do, and take so much of their valuable time to contribute to the policy development process and work closely with government, no matter who that government is, and, and that's, we need to do a lot more of that. Yes. Is there a question there? And that will be, I think, the last question before we, uh, before we break up. Thank you, Jeff. Thanks for being here. Are you going to be looking at funding for coming up with policy? I wonder if you could give us an idea. 
Mm. Uh, the short answer is yes. Uh, if you ask me any detail follow-up, the answer will be haven't figured it out yet. It's only his first hour <laughs> on the job. <laughs> it's, it's, but, but we're going to put our best people on it. Absolutely. <laughs> Who's the politician now? <laughs> okay. Um, I think we have... Thank you very much, Ron. Thank you. Thank you for being Thanks. with us today. Thank you. I want to... I want to thank Rana and Dom Barton and Michael Sabia yes. for saying yes to what was basically a blank check. It was pretty great. It was, they, they, they saw nothing in writing about what their responsibilities were, what their duties are. They didn't know that they had signed up for 20 years. <laughs> it's just, so, so thank you. And, and, I, and, I, and I look forward to getting you. What was you. that about a check? <laughs> I look forward to getting you and Dom and Michael Sabia together in a room so we can talk about all kinds of things, including the other 12 people we will have on the advisory yes. board. I look forward to it. it. And thank you to all of you for supporting uh, Chris's vision. I think, as I said, it's a bit risky, but I think there's going to be great rewards. Risk. Merci beaucoup. Risk is good. Merci. Thank you. Et, um, Merci à Chris, merci à Madame Ambrose et merci surtout des mots que vous avez euh, que vous avez dit Madame Ambrose sur euh, le rapprochement des communautés, le rapprochement de de l'est et l'ouest et euh, l'idée que ici à Montréal, à l'université McGill, euh, ça fait vraiment partie de nos nos ambitions euh, avec cette école. Merci beaucoup de merci. J'aimerais maintenant euh, euh, vous dire que l'après-midi la, ne vient que commencer, dans le sens que nous aurions deux panels cet après-midi qui vont commencer dans le salon printemps. Uh, the afternoon is just beginning. We have two panels which will now begin in the salon printemps down the hall um, uh, of the hotel. But before I uh, let you go, in a sense, I wanted to, again, uh, take another opportunity to thank Carolyn Hirsch and everyone from the Max Bell Foundation uh, for joining us, for supporting McGill, uh, for the McConnell Foundation, for our anonymous donors, and the donors who we know will now be um, uh, also sharing the vision uh, of the school, for all of the people in this room for helping to collaborate in our initiative. Um, you can tell the passion and commitment that we all have here at McGill, that we all have in the Max Bell Foundation, and. Uh, uh, Rana Ambrose and the other co-chairs as well. The ambition as well for this school um, is, is there. Et uh, j'aimerais aussi uh, vous dire que nous, uh, nous sommes très heureuses, uh, nous sommes très heureux de vous accueillir pour le reste de l'après-midi. Mais avant ça, I'd like to invite uh, uh, Madame uh, Principal Fortier to come up and present a gift to the Max Bell Foundation. So if Carolyn and all of our friends from the foundation would like to join me, along with Chris Reagan, Chris Manfredi, Madame Ambrose, um, and our Vice Principal uh, of Advancement, Mark Weinstein, we'd like to offer a token of our appreciation. As you can tell, it's a framed of picture of the logo for the Max Bell School of Public Policy. So in, in my first, uh, uh, how do you say, prise de bec uh, uh, with Chris Reagan, he chose the logo. So, um, uh, and it's a visual representation of what will become a very, very proud symbol for McGill. And let me ask Chris and Rana to also join uh, the photo. <laughs> 